You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs. I have Marcy McKay. She's the author of Transforming Your Stress. Uh, the topic is going to be transforming stress in families, which is very important. And uh, as far as I can see, uh, stress is at by far an all-time high. Anxiety, depression, all that stuff. So it's a very timely topic. She's an award-winning uh, author, speaker, teacher, a uh, mentor, a wife, a mom, and a friend. And we're going to talk about some of her stories that have shaped her life, and uh, possibly some of mine. And let's see what we can do to help listeners. So, Marcy, thanks so much for coming. I appreciate you having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, if you would. First thing I usually ask is about people's backgrounds and what led you to be interested in these topics. You know, usually it's because in their life, uh, the person has had a lot of experience with the topic. So what's your uh, what's your story of how you came to be here? Um, yeah, so I'm a quote, quote, nice girl from a nice family. You know, I've been married to the the same man for over 30 years, and um, I'm a writer. And uh, I was home alone one Friday afternoon in August of 2017, and our family had a house fire. And, um, you know, the house did not burn to the ground. They were able to save the majority of our belongings. But Rich, overnight, my life literally fell to pieces. And, and I didn't understand. You know, we, we had lived in that house for 17 years. And then one day we just never did again. And it was really because of the smoke and water damage that made the, the house um, uninhabitable. And... Mm. It was like a light switch. One day I felt like, you know, day before the fire, Marcy was happy. Day after the fire, Marcy was a basket case. And, you know, insomnia, depression, anxiety. I kept hearing the, the fire alarm in my head. And, and I come from a pick yourself up by the bootstraps kind of family. And I just, I didn't understand what, what was happening because, like I said, you know, I, I made it out fine they were able to save the vast majority of our belongings. So if you're going to have a house fire, that really is the way to do it. But I just fell to pieces. And so I went to one very recommended therapist because therapy had saved me in my, my early 20s after my dad died. That didn't help. I went to another therapist. That didn't help. I went to church more. I went to yoga even more. I drank kale juice, you know, like whatever anybody recommended. I tried and um, it just wasn't happening. And so I jokingly say I went on a journey to Humpty Dumpty myself back together again. Good question here. Uh, what, what was the reason for the fire? What caused it? The fire, it it was an, an old 1950s ranch style house. And we, uh, the family, there had only been one previous owner and the man had long since died. It was his widow we bought the house from, but he had considered himself a handyman. And so he had put a vent in above the stove and the vent was running and that, you know, the, the vent over the oven and stove had run, you know, countless times over the past 17 years, but it was old faulty wiring in the attic that started the fire. Mm, okay. Yeah. Understand. Yeah. Right. So it, it just, and that's when I started learning about stress patterns and, and trauma. And I didn't realize if you had asked me what trauma was the day before the fire, you know, I, I would have said it's, it's poverty, it's car wreck, it's war. And, and all those things are true. But I didn't realize that, you know, you you can have trauma if you come from a very loving family, but y'all moved all the time because of dad's job. Or if you grew up with a loving single mom, I just didn't realize that trauma comes in many shapes and sizes. And um, I just had a lot of unpacking to do from my loving childhood, but still... There was just some issues there, and um, so when 
the pandemic hit and I could tell that, you know, even though people were joking back in March of 2020 about, you know, toilet paper and baking sourdough bread, I thought this is traumatizing people and they don't understand it. And so that's why. Well, at least they got better with, with forced masks and vaccinations yeah. and uh, everyone uh, trying yeah. to you know, re route on each other. So, yeah, right. instead, of, instead of a real job on everybody. Right, right, right. But so that's why I wrote that book to try and, and help people understand their stress patterns, you know, physical, emotional and behavioral, because I, I didn't understand all that before our house fire. What's an example then of a stress pattern that maybe people are not aware of, but one that's common? You know, stress in adults shows up as as anxiety, insomnia, maybe over or under eating, over drinking, overspending. But but if you connect the dots, it all comes back to childhood patterns, and it doesn't have to be something, you know, d directly. Um, but maybe you had um, a, a controlling mom. Maybe you had a dad who was awesome, but he traveled all the time. And so you sort of had these coping mechanisms that, that you acquired. They say your stress patterns are formed by the time you're seven years old, and then they're double down set by the time you're 14. So I would just encourage your listeners to think of, you know, what was life like in, in kindergarten? And, and for my family, I mean, I have a mom and dad um, that, that I grew up grew up with they told me every day they loved me i believed them but what my family's trauma was when i was two my father was in a private plane crash and he's the only one who survived and so at first we didn't know if he was there or alive and then it was is he ever going to walk again and so that sort of started, it was nobody's fault. Um, well, I guess, you know, it was engine failure, but, it, you know, it, it, it's not like there was anything that, that mom or dad did. It's just something that happened to my family. But that started a pattern that everything, we all sort of walked on eggshells around my father. Was he having a good day? Was he having a not good day? And so I became hyper vigilant because I didn't mm. ever know who was walking through the door. Was it fun? Let's go get Baskin Robbins ice cream, dad. Was it moody brush bias, no reason, dad? Or was it come in screaming at us because, you know, our toys weren't, weren't picked up. Now I didn't understand mm. any of this until in my 50s after the the fire but it was that sort of thing that you know life happens to all of us and so we all come up with these coping mechanisms to deal with stress i think um i don't know it's just my my pet theory but you know i'm in my 40s my wife is in her 40s and um i think uh midlife crisis tied into people at you know at, at our age suddenly having to deal with stuff when you were kids that you just pushed away for decades, you know? Absolutely. Like my, yeah, like, you know, if anyone asked me, I'd be like, oh, you know, my childhood was this or that, but I'm fine. But then all of a sudden, the past few years, it's like, hmm, and now I'm revisiting that stuff, and it's, I realize that it's not fine. And it's, I, I just wonder if, uh, if you've experienced that at single lot. Absolutely. And so, Rich, for me, um, my... My stress pattern since I spent my whole life, and I adored my father. Um, you know, my, my family's house was like the fun house on the block. You know, there was always kids. There was always action going on. You know, people adored my father. He was really, really a, a great guy. But he had um, an alcoholic father. And so I think my dad thought he was father of the year that he didn't come home and beat us the way his dad did. But you you can um, you can hurt someone without ever even raising um, a finger. And so absolutely that in adulthood, our, our patterns follow us that we if you haven't dealt with it, it's going to come up either, you know, through um, insomnia, migraines, stomach problems, um, ulcers, or, you know, over drinking, just, you know, it can manifest uh, countless different ways. But what I didn't know before our house fire right now, if you were to Google the word stress, you would get over 1 billion results. So that means 
it's not your imagination. What Whatever you're struggling with that you keep trying to change and it won't, you know, likely it it reverts somewhere back to, to childhood. And so um, kind of getting back to what you said about unresolved issues, um, you know, I spent my, it was, I have an older, uh, older brother, younger sister, and it was sort of all of our jobs to always modify and adapt depending on what dad's mood was. Well, you know, one day ABC might work with him, but then the next day that didn't work. So you had to go to one, two, three. And then the next day, those two things didn't work and you had to do red, white, and blue. And so we just kind of, you know, again, we didn't realize any of this that we were doing. We just kept trying to make dad happy. And so I developed patterns of overgiving people pleasing, not good enough, and perfectionism. Well, did I, you know, handle that fire quote, quote, perfectly? No, um, because what what I didn't mention earlier is that when the, the fire alarm went off, um, there was no smoke, there was no fire, there, there was no burning smell. And so I waited like maybe just a little over two minutes before I called 911. But for me that lifelong pattern of perfectionism, I felt like our family had lost our house on my watch because it was the only home my kids had ever known. And that um, sort of reverts back to another pattern. My my dad was one of those people that if he was within a 200-mile radius of Waco, Texas, where I went to college at Baylor University, he would come visit me. And so sometimes it was just him. Sometimes it was just my mom. Sometimes it was the two of them. And I always spent the night with them because, you know, it was a nice hotel and I wanted to get away from roommates. And he came to visit me when I was 20 in 1987. And we went out to eat, had a great time, went back to his hotel room and, you know, visited and, you know, had Baskin Robbins ice cream and just had the best conversation we had ever had. And when, and I, that was the first time I didn't ever spend the night with him because I had a late night study group. And as I left that night, I thought we had turned a corner and I thought that's the first time he's ever treated me like an adult. And he had a heart attack and died alone in his hotel room. So do you kind of see what, what I'm talking about? Since my stress pattern is perfectionism, I was a super everything girl in junior high and high school and college, I felt like our family lost my dad on my watch. Then years later with the house fire, we lost it on, you know, my family, my adult family, we lost our house on my watch. And so that's when I really started learning about stress patterns, that perfectionism, that's what, that's why I fell to pieces after the fire. So when you say you fell to pieces, what what did that look like if you're open to talking about it? What happened to you? Absolutely. At the time, let me see, I'm 56. So I was like 51 when the fire happened, 50, 51. So I was already having hormone problems, but that just exacerbated. But it was also insomnia. Um, I've always been high energy, but it was just ratched up like a thousand percent and then depression and i i had never had depression like that before and just you know again i kept trying to pick myself up by the bootstraps and keep going like i had just always done and none of my coping mechanisms worked and so when it's really when i started learning about trauma and that something very vague like perfectionism can can be a trauma response in a stress pattern because I didn't handle the fire perfectly because I had called my husband saying, there's no smoke, there's no fire. Should I call 911? He was like, yes. And that's when I waited, you know, like another minute and a half before I called 911. And so what what I'd like your listeners to understand, you know, remember when I said if you Googled the word stress that you would get over 1 billion results? Ironically, there's also... 1 billion nerve fibers in your body. Like picture one of those skeleton Halloween costumes that, that you know, people can wear, you know, it's black and it's got the, the white skeleton body all over. 
the person, that's the way your body is on the inside with nerve fibers all along those those bones and tissue. One billion nerve fibers within your body and our bodies are like a walking, talking computer. And so it's all connected. Your brain and your body, it doesn't like change of any kind. So the bigger the change, the more your body's going to resist it. Secondly, your brain and your body doesn't know the difference between good stress and bad stress. Have, have you ever, you know, moved into a new place with your family, a new apartment, a new house? Okay, so is step one recognizing what the stresses are in your life? Or, if, you know, if you were to put, a, again, a diagram to this or a, a process or a method, what, what would that look like? Well, just what, whatever the, the stress is, because some stress is happy. Like if, if you um, are, are buying a new car, that's exciting, but it's also stressful because, you know, the car dealer comes out and hassles you and the salesman and the whole thing, but your, your body is sort of like scanning for danger all the time. And so it doesn't understand the difference between good stress and bad stress. It just reads it as bad stress. So like if you've ever gone on a family vacation, that can be so stressful, getting your family out the door, getting to the airport if if you're flying. It it just reads as as stress. And and then the the next thing is that it's all interconnected, Rich. Our bodies, like I said earlier, are like walking, talking computers. And and your your brain and your body records and remembers every single thing that's ever happened to you. And so things that, that, I mean, there's no way that we can remember every moment of every day, but your subconscious mind does. And so back to those stress patterns going on, you know, whatever happened in, in your childhood, good and bad, you know, however you respond to stressful things, more than likely it's a stress pattern from childhood, but it doesn't have to be a direct correlation because back in March of 2020, no one could ever say, oh, that global pandemic that I did in kindergarten, I know how to do that. You know, in March of 2020, nobody on the planet had ever gone through anything like that. And everybody was just kind of going bonker. Does that make sense? Well, I don't know. Do you mean like uh, you did a lot of people feel obligated to respond in one way or another or... Well, or people I, just told, uh, uh, we're all in this together, forget about your trauma, just shut up and go along with what we need to, to do, or what, what do you mean? No, I, I think it's because it seemed like, you know, leading it up, and, and I, you know, I don't want to get, like, political or anything like that. It's just nobody had ever gone through anything like that before. No one individually had, no one with with our, our communities and at na as nations and throughout the whole world. And so it was like, you know, suddenly everybody didn't go to work anymore. We were all told to stay, stay at home. And um, so what, whatever your, what I call bad behaviors, however you handle with stress, do you, do you undereat? Do you overeat? Do you overdrink? Do you spend money on stuff you don't need? Do you spend money on things that you don't have extra money to be spending on? And so that's why whenever things are stressful, we kind of have our go-to bad behaviors on on how we cope with things. So, all right. So, it, again, it sounds like I'm just making this up, but it sounds like recognize the stresses in your life and then, what, decide how you're going to react to them? Or what would be the step that you're talking about now? Well, I think it's different things for different people because... For me, I like talking about my feelings, and that helps me kind of work through things. My husband does not like to talk about his feelings. He'd rather go do kickboxing and punch something or, you know, go for a run and work it out physically. So it's just sort of however you you deal with, with stress in, in a healthy way do more of that but then it's also recognizing the unhealthy patterns that that you have like i'm not much of a drinker but sugar and carbs are like the bane of my existence and so i could polish off a plate of brownies and you know feel like i've been on a 10-day drunk it's not alcohol but it's still 
you know, metabolizes in my body like sugar and like alcohol. Okay. Um, so what kind of uh, advice are you trying to give to people? Again, like if it, you know, like a summary of your book, you know, we want to reveal everything because we want people to read it. But what are some of the highlights from it that either you've gotten positive feedback on or do you feel like is really important to communicate to people to help? Them? I think people always seem to resonate with the fact that it's not a contest. Everybody has stress. Everybody has something from their childhood that was less than perfect. Even if you had the happiest childhood, maybe maybe you had someone who tormented you in, in third grade or something like that. How is stress showing up for you? Is it more so in, in your body with physical stress symptoms? For me, it's just I couldn't seem to get out of this funk. And for me, it was more dealing with these emotions and then connecting the dots back to where the patterns began. And then that's how you can change them. It's the easiest way to get stress is to work it out physically. That is, is one way. Finding someone, whether it's a professional or a friend, someone that you feel like you can be real with to talk about your stress. And then it's also it's almost like a balancing act, Rich, of, of doing more things to take care of yourself, whether it's, you know, you, you like to just go drive out in, you know, out in the country and listen to, to music that, that you love. Do you, you like meditation? Do you like watching sitcoms? I mean, whatever you kind of can do to help boost yourself um, out of that stress, finding just little things that you can do every day, whether it's take, you know, five minutes to, to call um, one of your best buddies, five minutes to sit and watch cat videos that make you laugh, five minutes to, to read some articles that, that you enjoy, five minutes to decide what you want to plan uh, to do this weekend. Just little, little things can make a big difference if you just find these little things to do each day. But then on the flip side, it's also getting better at having, you know, setting boundaries, having hard conversations within your family at work, wherever stress is popping up for you. So let's say someone's stressed, but they're, they're beyond what would be a normal stress. Like they're really headed for, for trouble in their life. Okay. The stress and how to react to it. Like, how does someone identify when they're getting to that point? What should they look for? And then, you know, how can they help themselves if, if it's really starting to become a problem? You know, let's say they've gotten to your book, but they're way down the road. They're just not in a good place. What does that look like, you know, well, stress-wise? And, and what yeah, can... so you're talking to s about someone who's either, either like deep in overwhelm or burnout or something like that? Right. Yeah. Okay. So for those kind of people, you can tell... If you feel like there is no end in sight, like normal stress is, oh my gosh, you know, here it is Friday, I'm so grateful, or I'm going to take off the day, you know, you can kind of feel like you can do little things to sort of get back on your feet. But if you are truly like, you just feel like life sucks, it has always sucked, it's always going to suck, then that's when um, if, if the opportunity is available for professional help that's i would say do that but i understand that that you know sometimes money is tight and that's not an option there are more online resources than there have ever ever been before and so i would just really try and and pinpoint how is that stress showing up you know are are you o over drinking are you isolating you know are are you feeling like just you cannot climb your way out of this funk? Just try and look at how is it showing up. Try and find groups online that deal with that for, for overeating, over drinking. Um, maybe you struggle with self-harm, you know, just whatever. If you can pinpoint it more, there are lots of free resources and, you know, chat groups on on facebook go there and if if possible um reach out to someone because when we are in a dark place it, it feels like it's always going to be that way but another person might be able to help 
point you in the right directions. But I understand that, you know, if people are really stressed, they might not want to burden someone else. And then I would say Google is your best friend to try and find some of the free online resources out there. So what were the feedback and comments you got from your book from readers? I think one of the nicest compliments that I get is, uh, you know, I'm I am not a a PhD. I'm not a shame researcher like like Brene Brown. You know, I'm just a writer, and because I'm a writer, I I explain things through stories. You know, people will say that they feel like you know they are sitting with me in a coffee shop. And I'm just kind of holding them by the hand and baby stepping them through their stress patterns. Because I have probably 30 sort of different assessments for people to figure out what are your physical stress patterns? What are your emotional stress patterns? What are your behavioral stress patterns? Where are your stress origins? Where, you know, where did they, I just kind of really break it down. So remedial. It's almost like stress for dummies. And I don't, I don't mean that to sound condescending. It's just, I really explain it in a basic way that people get. And then the other nice thing is that people say that my, my book is funny because I tell it through stories and I just, I like to laugh. And so I like to write funny stuff. Okay. Um, in addition to writing the book, what are, I believe it said in your bio, you provide mentorship. Like what, what are some of your other activities surrounding stress that you do besides writing? I do work with with people wanting to up level and create the life they've always wanted. I do a lot of corporate coaching and, and working with businesses and nonprofits to help organizations sort of figure out how they can work and play better together in the sandbox of life because that's sort of my background is leadership consulting in addition to writing. So I, I do a lot of different things and that's fun because no two days of my life are ever, ever look the same. Hmm. Well, so what's your hope for the future or do you have any big ambitious projects you're working on or is it more like one at a time each person yeah. you help you're happy? Yeah, sort of that, but but also I'm really wanting to get back to my fiction, and so I'm not taking on, I am taking on clients, I'm just not taking on as many as I have in the past because I'm really wanting to have more time and space for my writing. But one thing that I really want to stress to your listeners, and, and you and I sort of touched on this before we started recording about your car accident and my family's house fire. I thought that fire was the worst thing that ever happened to me because I just, my thinking was very black and white then. Now I'm so grateful that it happened. What I thought was the worst thing to ever happen to me ended up being the best thing to ever happen to me because it forced me to deal with issues that I didn't even realize were issues. And so... I want to encourage your listeners, no matter what, and I believe this with all my heart, no matter what someone is struggling with, it's changeable. Now, it's not easy, and it doesn't happen overnight, but if people are willing to put in the work to do things differently to change their stress patterns, I, I am happier and healthier than I've ever been. My marriage is better. I'm a happier wife, mom, just human across the board. And so that's, I really want to leave people with hope that whatever you're dealing with, it's it's changeable. Okay, excellent. Well, Marcy, what's the best way for people to get in touch? I would guess they should get the book first. So can you restate the title? And then sure. uh, how else can they reach you? Yeah, the, the book is called Transforming Your Stress, and you can find it anywhere books are sold online. I hang out most on, on Instagram or sometimes Facebook, and and my handle is author Marcy McKay, and then my website is marcymckay.com. Okay, great. Marcy, well, thanks for coming and for turning your life experiences into positive things that can help other people with their stress. I'm, well, I'm glad you, you came on the podcast. And I feel the same way about you. I love that you've taken your pain and put it into a, a beautiful purpose for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you for listening to The Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. 
And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. <laughs>